Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another interview of the ISQG. Uh, my name is Linda Vermanen, and I'm here today with Carlo Ravelli. Uh, welcome, Carlo, and thank you for accepting this interview. Thank you very much, Linda. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so, uh, Carlo, you did your PhD at the University of Padova a time ago, and you're currently uh, a professor at the University of Marseille, and you hold a visiting chair at the uh, Perimeter Institute, and you're also a member of the Watman Institute of the Western University. Now you're most familiar with uh, about uh, for loop quantum gravity, but you also do work in quantum mechanics and philosophy. So maybe you could tell us yourself a bit about what are your research interests, what have you done, and why do you think it's interesting? Um, my recent interests are many. Um, I guess I'm mostly focused on uh, uh, black holes and white holes. We may say something about that later on. Um, what I've done in my life, uh, it's uh, many things. Uh, in science, I guess, uh, uh, loop quantum gravity has been my focus, interest, uh, theory in which uh, I've contributed. A lot of people have contributed. I mean, hundreds of people have contributed. So I've uh, I, I, I've worked for uh, 20, 30 years on this theory. Um, the other topics of my interest have been uh, the interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is uh, so between physics and philosophy. Um, I have developed uh, uh, and contributed to an interpretation called the relational interpretation, which is alternative to many world and uh, hidden variables and others. Um, and uh, I have worked a lot on conceptual issues, and in particular, the, the nature of time. And the other thing I'm doing a lot right now, it's trying to understand all the all the different arrows of time, how they're connected. Why we don't remember the past uh, and not the future, why we can decide the future and not the past, uh, why effects come after the cause and not before. Uh, and, uh, and and uh, and and so on, but all these various interests um, have been motivated along of my uh, career uh, by quantum gravity. Because if you want to understand quantum gravity, you need to get clarity about uh, what's the best way to think quantum mechanics um, suitable for doing quantum gravity and how to think time and uh, these kind of questions. So um, questions are many, but this, the, the, the core interest has been quantum gravity all my life. Yeah. So uh, talking about gravity, why do you think it's important that we study gravity or quantum gravity? Um, <clears throat> because uh, from the point of view of our understanding of the physical world, the basic equations, um, which of course is not the understanding of all of the wall of physics, because a, a lot of physics uh, regards uh, big system, complex systems, and uh, and and what happens uh, at the ground level is is not relevant. But for understanding the ground level, the the, the basic physics, the equations that underpin everything, uh, we basically have very good set of equations that describe everything, but not everything. Uh, there is a hole. There is a there is something that is missing. And uh, uh, the, what is missing is how to describe the uh, phenomena like the Big Bang or uh, some aspect of black holes where quantum mechanics is involved and uh, relativistic gravity is involved. So it's really uh, a missing uh, part of fundamental physics that we, <clears throat> we, we haven't figured out yet. Uh, in the past, every time we have understood something fundamental about the world, with the electromagnetics, quantum mechanics, uh, uh, or cosmology, the, the effect on our intellectual understanding of the world and our technology has been absolutely major. So nobody can forecast what will come out from a, a consensual, final, convincing theory of quantum gravity. Uh, but definitely, it's it's a core uh, it's a core question in understanding of reality. It's important to distinguish quantum gravity from these ideas that have motivated many uh, theoretical physicists in the last decades to unify everything, to get a single equation that describe all particles, all forces. Uh, uh, that's an interesting project, but it's not needed to understand. Not necessarily needed for understanding specific phenomena, uh, that's a dream. Maybe there is a single equation that uh, 
explain everything. That's not the problem of quantum gravity. That's the problem of unification. The problem of quantum gravity is specifically understanding the quantum property of gravitational field. What makes it interesting and fascinating and stupendously beautiful is that gravitational field is also what determines uh, what we call the geometry of space-time, the rate at which clocks go and uh, the, what, what determines the length of things, how long is this, is the gravitational field. So the quantum aspects of gravity are also the quantum aspect of space and the quantum aspect of time. So to understand the quantum gravity, it's understanding what is the quantum space and it was quantum time. Therefore, the problem of quantum gravity is not only at the center of modern physics, uh, of what we don't know about modern physics, but is also uh, going to affect uh, in depth uh, what we think about space and time. So some basic concept of structure we use to understand the world. So we've already tried to quantize gravity for quite a long time right now. So why do you think we're struggling so much with, with quantizing gravity? And what do you think the community could do better? Um, <clears throat> the reason we don't have a, 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 a final uh, a consensual theory of quantum gravity, I believe, it's mostly because um, those regimes which uh, we need to, to explain with quantum gravity are very hard to reach uh, um, experimentally in a direct manner. Uh, we don't have time to wait for a black hole to evaporate and look what happened. Um, the Big Bang is very far away, is screened uh, from us by what happened in between. And uh, in our everyday life, uh, um, there are not many phenomena we, we can easily find that involve both gravity and quantum and quantum mechanics. So it's a, it's a difficulty of, uh, of reaching uh, these regimes, uh, uh, which is the uh, difficulty. And the reason is that um, it, we have theories of quantum gravity. It's not that we don't have theories of quantum gravity. I mean, a, a century of work has produced theory of quantum gravity, uh, but uh, more than one. And so we have to experimentally uh, figure out, and we have had some experimental hints from nature that favor some direction and disfavor some other direction. Uh, so it's not that we don't have input from nature, but very little. So uh, I think uh, to get to the second question of yours, uh, where we are now is that there are some theories of quantum gravity written down, incomplete, like all human endeavors, uh, but uh, quite in good shape. And I think what the community most uh, uh, usefully should do now is make an effort to uh, take the theories and compare them with, with experience instead of just uh, trying at libitum to develop the uh, to develop the, the theory. I think that the wrong idea is that uh, we don't have good ideas around for understanding quantum gravity. We, we do have very good ideas around for understanding quantum gravity. The problem is that uh, we have to check them. And physics is not about dreaming and having ideas, uh, period. And it's not about doing math either. Physics is about describing the world. So we need to, um, I think what the community needs to do is to use the idea of around and make an effort uh, to connect it to, 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 to the real world, to observation, to astrophysics, uh, to something that can do in the lab or observe in the universe uh, that would tell us this idea is good, this idea is bad. Yeah. Yes, I say we have a couple of theories, uh, but no experimental proof observation uh, yet. And also some people actually believe that, that gravity should not be quantized at all or that we could never even test it. So what do you think about this? And where do you think we're gonna, it's the most likely we're gonna observe quantized gravity? Um, I don't think there are people who, who think that quantum gravity can that gravity cannot be quantized. I think that there are people who there have been some suggestions, but these are extremely minoritary. I don't I don't know anybody who actually really believe that. There are people who have suggested that perhaps uh, the gravitational field is it doesn't have a, a quantum effects at all. Uh, this has been thrown out as a possibility. It's an extremely unlikely possibility. I think that very few people would bet for it. Uh, I have a bet for it. Somebody wanted to bet for that uh, um, one against a thousand. <laughs> so I was not very confident in its own uh, bet. So um, um, 
if uh, if I win, I'll win one dollar. If I lose, I'll lose a thousand dollars. Now there is no theory uh, that uh, in which the rest of the world is quantum and gravity is classical. There are some vague ideas, but there's no coherent story where this is possible. Nevertheless, uh, the fact that the gravitational field is quantized is a it's it's a deduction from other things we know about nature. So um, also this is a good idea to test. I mean, it's very implausible that that's not the case, uh, but it's a very good idea to test. And the good news is that there are experiments right now which are being prepared uh, to test it, um, which I think will be super exciting uh not so much because uh, will give us something unexpected i think will give us something very expected everybody expect namely that yes um gravity has a quantum aspect um if they wouldn't it would be even more surprising so there would be even more reason to to be to be excited if they would give the opposite answer but even if they give the answer that everybody expects, namely, yes, the quantum effect of gravity, that uh, would be, uh, for the first time, a clear-cut observation of a quantum gravity experiment. And these experiments are not done yet. Um, it's not They're not easy to do, but the good is that they're experimented in the laboratory. So it can be done in a laboratory uh, with the current technology by splitting quantum particles and studying their gravitational interaction and what uh, what comes out is a, it's an argument that shows that if a certain thing come out, if you can entangle particles using gravity necessarily, uh, gravity must be uh, quantum because classical uh, um, system, ca classical entities cannot entangle quantum things. So if this is done, this would be first uh, first to very clearly observe the quantum gravitational phenomenon. The bad news is that uh, uh, that would be fantastic. I think could be a Nobel Prize result, but it wouldn't help us to tell us which theory of quantum gravity is right, because all theories we have of quantum gravity predict that equally. And uh, if they differ, they differ uh, not in things that can be tested in the laboratory, as far as we know, but only at very high energies. So I remember um, in an article that you wrote, you also talked about uh, dark matter as quantum gravity stabilized white holes. And you pointed out that we're already seeing, maybe seeing massive quantum gravity effects named dark matter. But could you elaborate a bit on that? Yes, um, this is a speculative idea. Uh, it's an open possibility. It's not something that has been... Uh, uh... Uh, tested and uh, it, it, it depends on a number of, uh, of assumptions. Um, but there's an actual possibility, which I think is open, that uh, we already have a, a, a vast observation of a quantum gravity phenomena, which is dark matter. Dark matter, it's uh, um, something the astronomers see in the sky, and more precisely, they see the effect of dark matter. They see light, bend, light bended by dark matter. They see the gravitational effect of dark matter. Um, but there are some uh, general arguments that show that dark matter is not powder, is not stones, is not planets, is not stars, is not most of the uh, usual things uh, we know make up the, the universe. So it's a big puzzle what dark matter is. It's an open puzzle. It's an unexplained observation. There are many tentative explanations, but there's one which is particularly interesting that does not require any new physics, any uh, strange hypothesis, um, which is that uh, dark matter could be made by black holes or more precisely by black hole remnants. The black hole evaporates, becomes smaller and smaller. At the end of the evaporation, loop quantum gravity suggests that the black hole, which is a, it's become very small outside, but is a very big inside, uh, could uh, a quantum jump into a white hole, uh, which is the same the same interior and the same small uh, throat. Uh, so from the outside is the same little thing, but now it's a white hole. So instead of falling in, things can fall come out. So this uh, the theory predicts that this white hole um, can be stable uh, because of a quantum gravitational phenomena. Uh, essentially, it's the same reason for which atoms are, are stable because there's a minimal energy level on which they can sit. And the same for white hole. 
they could be stabilized by quantum mechanics and they uh, if if this if all this is correct uh, and if there are primordial black holes old black holes uh, that have been long in the sky and have time to evaporate they should be like little grains of powder going around in the universe and they could be uh, dark matter or a component of dark matter. So it is possible that we have already seen dark matter. Um, there is something that not many people know, which is that um, black holes, which are the great surprise of the last decades. Now we, we have seen very clearly evidence of uh, black holes uh, in the sky. <laughs> and we see the gravitational waves produced by black holes. We have pictures of black holes. But 20 years ago, nobody believed in black holes because there was little evidence. But what people, not pe many people know is that actually black holes were observed since a uh, century almost, in the 30s, last century, um, as radio waves coming from the center of the galaxy. In fact, the first big telescope, radio telescope, the first small radio telescope that was, uh, uh, that was constructed by Jansky in the 30s, detecting a signal coming from the center of the galaxy and nobody knew what it was for decades and decades and decades and only recently it has been clarified that it's a black hole it's a huge black hole immense black hole so black holes is uh, has been very mysterious until 20 years ago everybody was saying we don't have any evidence of black holes but actually uh, we had there was this signal we just had not recognized it so it might happen the same with quantum gravity i mean um white hole remnants, uh, black hole remnants, white hole could be uh, a quantum gravitational phenomenon, the, the consequence of a quantum gravitational phenomenon, which we have been observing for, for long without recognizing it. Um, I'm not saying that I'm sure that this is the case. I'm not at all, because there are many things to check. But uh, that's a possibility. That's an example of, of a, a good possibility in which a quantum gravity phenomenon could be not only discovered, but just recognized um, by understanding a little bit more, like happened by, with black holes recently. So there are also uh, other tests uh, proposed about quantum gravity, like tests with both Einstein condensate. Uh, why do you think these tests that, that you mentioned about entanglement and everything, uh, why do you think those are the, the most promising, or why do you really pick those tests? Uh, the the one with Bose condensates are a variant. It's the same basic idea um, as the one we mentioned before with entangled particles. Uh, this is a laboratory test, and these are all uh, tests of the first kind. What I said before, so uh, testing that actually uh, space time is quantum. Namely, um, there could be quantum superposition of space time geometries. Uh, there could be quantum gravitational phenomena. Um, I am not a experimentalist, so I don't know which version among these uh, is going to be the most promising. There's a lot of work today to just uh, figure out what is the best experimental technique for revealing this phenomenon. The, the theory is sort of understood. The question is, uh, it's, uh, do we have the technology? Uh, technology is close, uh, but not yet there. Um, the other kind of observations is uh, uh, it's actually observation that could distinguish um, something predicted of one specific theory of, of, of gravity, like the dark matter that I mentioned before. There are other uh, possibility. Uh, the other one, the main one, uh, it's uh, all the Big Bang, uh, the early universe uh, physics. We, we have a beautiful picture of the universe, uh, what happened to the universe for the last 30 billion and so years. Uh, uh, but what happened with the universe is very, very compressed. At the beginning of this story, we, we need a quantum theory of gravity. So there's been a lot of work in uh, sort of quantum cosmology, as it's called, so the quantum um, effects in the early universe. And uh, um, the hope is that uh, some of the observations uh, of the sky, like the cosmic background radiation, could give us uh, um, indications that some of the modeling what happened in the, in the universe is is, uh, is correct. So that the that the other the other big hope loop quantum gravity has some indications, um, and uh, the cosmological observations as astro astronomers, uh, uh, it's it's booming. We have an enormous amount of new information about the universe. So that's the other the other direction. Um, there have been other uh, recent 
empirical observation, experiment observations that have had a huge effect on quantum gravity. And let me mention um, two or two or three. Uh, one is a non-discovery of supersymmetry at CERN. This has been a major, major event in theoretical physics. The reason is because a big part of the community, a large ch chunk of the community, um, especially all those working in supersymmetry, string theory, and related with that, expected supersymmetry to be found at, at CERN. And it wasn't. And, you know, when... Uh, the way science works is by Bayesian uh, positive or negative confirmation. So if you have a theory that leads you to th to expect something and this happens, you believe the theory more. Okay. If you have a theory that somehow believes pushes you to believe something to happen, it doesn't happen, you believe the theory less. So that's one of the reasons string theory and related the related world uh, nowadays uh, it's much more um, convincing in the mind of many, in the minds of many than what it was 10 years ago. Because uh, the entire world expected something and nature says, no, no, that's not the case. That's uh, that's not the world, how the world is. And it's not the first time because uh, it already happened with the cosmological constant. <clears throat> uh, string theory is naturally defined with a neg negative cosmological constant. So much so that the entire world expected that um, once measured, the cosmological constant would be negative. But 10 years ago, the astronomers measured the cosmological constants, and to the surprise of that world, it turned out to be positive. And again, this is a negative Bayesian confirmation. So the the the, uh, the confidence, I mean, you know, we're exploring the unknown. Nobody knows who is right, who is wrong. And we're going different directions. So the, 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 there's a wall, string theory, and the that was going in a direction and, and, and nature says no, and then says no. So you say, well, maybe that's the wrong direction, okay? Um, but the other uh, ways of addressing the, the problem of quantum gravity, like loop quantum gravity, uh, don't need supersymmetry. And in fact, uh, the other part of the community was not expecting supersymmetry and was not expecting a negative cosmological constant. So nature said, said yes and yes. And I think we should listen to nature, and uh, nature has been uh, um, has been talking. Another similar example, um, it's Lorentz invariance. The, 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 there's uh, somebody who tried to make sense of quantum gravity by breaking Lorentz invariance, by breaking special relativity, so to say, by having a preferred reference uh, reference frame in in in, in fundamental reality. Um, this led to. <laughs> some predictions of possible phenomena, astrophysical phenomena, which were not observed. And in fact, it was observed the opposite, that Lorentz invariance is conserved, is preserved, is satisfied um, in astrophysical phenomena. So a big chunk of uh, research uh, that was exploring um, uh, Lorentz breaking fundamental theories, they call one of them called hojava Lipsic uh, theory, they found themselves in difficulty because nature has said not. Um, this, these things have happened uh, repeatedly. Alternative generativity have been uh, basically ruled out by some astrophysical observation. Recently, the uh, merging of neutron stars has been observed by gravitational waves and uh, uh, electromagnetic waves arriving at the same time, meaning that they have the same speed. And many theories predict a different speed. So this theory have been uh, losing losing credibility. So uh, it's not that quantum gravity is disconnected from experiment. It's very connected to experiment. It's very much listening to nature. Uh, not yet at the point of uh, singling out uniquely uh, a theory that doesn't have the doesn't have a, a, a negative cosmological constant, supersymmetry, low energy breaking. So we, we we're taking away pieces. Uh, but we're not yet at the point in which the community says, okay, um, we have to concentrate on this. Um, for this, probably we need something more, more positive, some, some specific prediction um, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, satisfied. If dark matter turned out to be uh, black hole stabilized, uh, white hole stabilized by quantum gravity, that could be a good step ahead. Mm -hmm. So if you would have to make an estimate about how long it would take to find to find some experimental proof of observation of quantized gravity. Uh, how long do you, do you think it will take that we find some observations? I think nobody knows. And uh, uh, if we knew, we would uh, uh, we would be much more ahead. And uh, 
uh, nature has surprised us uh, repeatedly uh, in both directions. Um, people expected to find uh, something beyond the standard model 30 years ago, and they were wrong. Uh, I was uh, not expecting to detect gravitational waves uh, a few years ago, and I was wrong. That came much before than I expected. Um, when uh, when we're in the middle of a struggle, it seems that nothing happens. But then if you look back in the decades, uh, you see that things happen and happen fast. I mean, the, the way we look at the world changes uh, rapidly. So everything in the in the last years with black hole cosmology, gravitational waves uh, has been a lot. Uh, the Higgs, the, the, the entanglement. Uh, so um, we might be, I have no idea. Uh, we may be surprised by nature. My hope is that uh, I'm, I'm not young anymore. My hope is that uh, in my life, I'm going to see a good positive uh, sign that uh, that the quantum gravity theory on which I've been working so long, it's, it's actually uh, nature saying yes. So hopefully we will have fast some, some observations. So I would also like to talk, uh, talk about, about loop quantum gravity, obviously. So loop quantum gravity is often said the biggest competitor of string theory. Uh, but first, in simple terms, can you maybe explain what is loop quantum gravity and how does it distinguish itself from other theories such as string theory? Um, as I said at the beginning, string theory is much more ambitious. It's an attempt to write uh, to, to to solve all sorts of problems together and to write sort of the final theory of, of, of science. Uh, a single equation from which uh, uh, all the different forces, all the different particles, all the different symmetries, uh, everything comes out uh, sort of naturally. Um, quantum gravity is a much more, loop quantum gravity is a much more, um, uh, much less ambitious uh, theory, which only want to solve the, 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 the single thing we don't understand, and, uh, keeping many forces, many particles, and leaving to our um children and grandchildren the, the, the task of uh, of uh, of writing the final theory of science. I don't think we're going to ever write the final theory of science. The universe is far more complicated than what our little brain um, uh, grasps. We're going to understand one thing at a time. And, and I think uh, 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 loop quantum gravity has correctly trying to understand one thing at a time. But the one thing at a time is is uh, it's major. It's, uh, it's a quantum nature of space and time. And the the beauty of loop quantum gravity is, has, has been straight to uh, to the core problem. I mean, what is a quantum space? What is a quantum time? And uh, it has, a, a, I guess, the, the reason it has been growing uh, and has uh, uh, worked uh, quite well uh, solving its own problem is that it has focused exactly on this problem. So it has constructed a mathematical um, framework and mathematical laws, a very clean mathematical formalism uh, to describe quantum space and quantum time, the quantum structure of space-time. Because uh, the connection is, of course, that uh, we have learned from Einstein that uh, time, space and time, the geometry of space and time, everything which has to do with temporal intervals and, uh, and geometry, length, angles, areas, volumes, uh, uh, that's determined by the gravitational field. That's a property of the gravitational field. It's a feature of a gravitational field. So quantum gravitational field means quantum space-time. And um, um, loop quantum gravity treats space-time, gravitational field, same thing, uh, treats space-time as a quantum object. Um, and uh, it was born with this idea and uh, uh, it has succeeded in constructing um, a quantum theory of, of, of space-time, which is uh, consistent with quantum theory and in the classical limit, it's consistent with, uh, with general relativity. So it is a quantization of uh, general relativity. It is a possible solution of the problem. It has all sorts of open problems. Uh, of course, it's a complicated theory. It's very hard to do calculations. Um, Nowadays, a big chunk of the community is using computers to uh, compute quant loop quantum gravity um, amplitudes. Uh, for instance, this black hole to white hole quantum jump has been studied with computers. Um, so this means it's not, it's not a theory where one sit down and re very easily do calculations, but that's okay. We have other theories like that. Quantum chromodynamics is what happened in the nucleus of the atoms. Also is a theory which is very hard to do calculations, but it's a very good theory. 
Um, the the theory has been growing for since the eighties because it started in the late eighties, is developed in the nineties. The main result in the in the nineties. Uh, um, then there was a lot of confusion about the dynamics. There were different ways of doing the dynamics. Uh, <clears throat> the way which I think has been more more has, has, has uh, evolved uh, much and better and give the best version, the best more workable version so far, was developed uh, at the beginning of this uh, of this century, uh, ten years ago, and uh, nowadays uh, it's um, I think a lot of effort is in trying to apply these formulas. The main result of the theory and also the most beautiful one is that it described directly uh, a quantum space. And a quantum space, uh, um, uh, you see, is the analog of uh, a quantum electromagnetic field. So the, quant the electromagnetic field, the waves, light, light is waves. But when you study the quantum properties, um, what you obtain from the formalism uh, is uh, what Einstein saw before anybody else, uh, which is the, the electromagnetic fields are actually uh, formed by little quanta. That's the name quantum. Quant quantum theory comes from the quanta. Quanta are the little packets, the little particles um, of light, the photons. So there's this granularity. And uh, uh, what loop quantum gravity does is treat uh, space quantum mechanically and finds mathematically the uh, this quanta of space, these grains of space. So it, uh, it resolves the continuity of space into a granular structure um, which is a, it's a quantum granular structure. So it's, it's like all other quantum phenomena. Uh, it includes probability, it includes uh, fuzziness, it includes all the, all the features, the funny feature of quantum mechanics, but not the quantum mechanic of atoms or molecules or particles or whatever. Um, it's a quantum mechanic of space itself. That's what the, the, theory, uh, the theory directly describes. And it allows us to compute numerically precisely the size of these uh, grains of space, how they are connected, the, the mathematical structure, and uh, how they uh, jump, quantum jump from one another, how they transform themselves from one another, so how the dynamics emerge from uh, from this structure. So the theory is uh, it's very beautiful. It's very different than uh, conventional uh, field theory or that uh, particle physics uh, uh, high energy physics, because uh, in the rest of physics, one assumes that there's space and, and, and it's a fixed background and time that passes, uh, and then does the physics of things in space and in time. Well, here we're doing the physics of space itself, of time, and uh, uh, and that's the beauty. So it forces us to go deep and precise in thinking what we mean by space, what we mean by time, and that's why I've spent a lot of time trying to get clarity of what we mean by space, what we mean by time in the context of quantum gravity. One of the last paper I finished is a sort of conceptual clarity about how to do quantum gravity uh, if this direction of investigation is correct. So can you tell us uh, why loops, what other loops in loop quantum gravity? The name loop is it's a bit historical in reality. Right now, there are not many loops in in, in loop quantum gravity, um, but uh, uh, the 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 way to understand is this: this I said that uh, uh, space is uh, can be thought of many 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 quanta many grains, like um, like a bunch of sand. Sand is many grains, right? But sand, careful, sand is immersed in space. So when you say that two grains of sand are near to one another, because they are in space near to one another, while the quantum space are not immersed in space, so they don't know if they are near to one another or not. So the mathematical structure that describes them is not just a, a disconnected set of points. It's a disconnected set of points plus the information of who is connected to whom, who is next to whom. So it forms a network, many points with these lines in between. Okay, and on a network, in fact, it's called spin network in the in the in the jargon of the of quantum gravity. So the 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 state, the quantum state of space time, are described by the spin networks, which is some, some mathematics that go back to Roger Penrose, the British mathematician who got the Nobel Prize for uh, recently um, for his understanding of um, of generativity, space and time, and these networks. So imagine a network like a network, the networks of uh, of a fisherman, right? They think you get to to catch fish or to catch butterflies. 
Um, so there are these nodes and links between between the nodes. Now, if you start from a node, you can link, jump to through a link to another node and loop back. You can make a loop, okay? So the simplest possible network uh, is just one node and a loop. That's a zero level uh, network. And when loop quantum gravity was found, the first states of quantum gravity that were written down on paper were just loops, okay? And then people say, well, what would you do with loops? You can put many loops but then they have to interact, so they interact and they cross. So there's many loops that cross from a network. So we got to the idea of network passing through the loops. And uh, uh, jumping from one step to the other is crucial because, uh, um, because for, for a deep reason. Because in physics, what matters is not what happened at a point, it's what happened when you go around the loop, okay? Um, the the, the, the correct understanding of the uh, gauge theories that describe the world, including general relativity, it's, uh, it's describing what happened in loops. For instance, the curvature of space-time, which is a main quantity used to, um, to describe the geometry, can be understood uh, if, you're, if you're on Earth and you move on a, on, on a loop on Earth. So you're on North Pole, you go down to the equator, you move around the equator, you come back. Things happen. For instance, if you put your finger uh, always straight, you come back rotated if you go around the loop. This is called the holonomy. It's a it's a phenomenon that captures the fact that the Earth is curved. It doesn't happen on a plane. You can but don't come back rotated. So by going around the loop, you capture how things are connected. And the core of how nature works is how things are connected, not how things are. So that's why uh, the name loops remained. Uh, because it's, it's, it's studying what happened along loops, which you understand, you understand what uh, what happened. So one of the big achievements of, of loop quantum gravity is that it's background independent. Uh, could you maybe explain what is background independent and why is it so important? Um, it uh, what 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 I mean what is meant by background independence basically is what I just said, namely the theory is not defined on a background, so space and time are not considered a, a fixed stage where where nature where, where things happen, uh, but are considered the the, the object themselves we are describing. So these quanta of space are not uh, in space; they are space themselves. That's background independence. There's no background. There's no there's no, or if you want the background is the object we are describing itself, space is the object we are describing. Um, in the past, it was always uh, emphasized that this aspect of quantum gravity, uh, mostly because uh, uh, some alternatives uh, uh, like string theory of the time at the time were formulated uh, very much by first fixing a background and then writing fields on this background. But I think it's a it's an old uh, discussion because uh, nowadays uh, string theory and other uh, other tentative theory of quantum gravity they all evolved, uh, realizing that background independence of this uh, fact that the theory should not depend on a on a on, on a fixed background, uh, it's a required uh, aspect. Uh, it's it's uh, something we have understood about the world with general relativity. So uh, so much so quantum gravity must have this property. Uh, so I wouldn't say that now it's something that characterizes loop quantum gravity specifically. You said, you've said already a lot of, of good things about loop quantum gravity, but are there any other uh, achievements of loop quantum gravity that, that haven't uh, mentioned yet or that are maybe less familiar to people? Well, um, I think that the... the I, I would point to two. Uh, one is the the specific predictions about uh, the quantitative predictions uh, <clears throat> about this granular uh, structural space. Um, this is a calculation in the nineties. Uh, uh, if you if you whatever way we could measure or whatever is determined by um, geometrical quantities, for instance, uh, the area of any surface. Uh, uh, it's quantized, namely is uh, can only take certain values, and these values have been computed in the theory. They only depend on a single free parameter. Uh, so this is like the computation of the of the energy levels of the atomic of of the hydrogen atom. Of in fact, for all the atoms, that can be done with conventional quantum mechanics. 
which was a great achievement of uh, Schrodinger before him, Pauli. Uh, so that's a specific prediction of quantum loop quantum gravity, very, very much characterizing the core, the core of the theory, uh, which might be right or wrong. And if the theory is wrong, the theory is wrong. Um, it's hard to test it because this uh, very small areas quantized are very, very small, so very rapidly when the areas um, become big, the, 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 the area levels are so close that the, the fact of continuous cannot be experimentally resolved. That's one uh, um, uh, major achievement of the theory. But the second one I would say is that for a long time it was hard to connect uh, um, this beautiful description of quantum space to the to the Einstein equations, to the to the dynamics, to the to the continuous theory. And nowadays uh, we have a lot of theorems and and results uh, that connect the, the the quantum amplitudes that can be computed uh, in the covariant version of loop quantum gravity with classical general relativity. So there is a lot which is known. Not everything is known. There's things still to be understood, but there is a lot of which is known. Um, um, in the classical limit of the theory. So I think uh, recovering the Einstein equations uh, from this uh, discrete quantum structure was a spectacular achievement. It started with a theorem with uh, John Barrett and collaborators, and then a sequence of theorems. Then there was a lot of confusion because it seemed something to be wrong. It was called the flatness problem that was resolved completely. So um, I think it's, uh, it's inc increasingly clear that the theory does give the right classical limit. So it's a quantum theory with a with the right classical limit, which is what you want. And third, or maybe I should say the first of all, uh, there's a, the a theorem. The, the, the prediction of the theory do not have ultraviolet divergences. And that was a problem at the very beginning. So if you if you take Einstein theory of gravity <clears throat> and just apply quantum mechanics naively, you close your eyes and you do what you do with electromagnetism and the rest, you have these ultraviolet divergences, these infinities that come out, jump out everywhere in the calculations, which make the theory useless. <clears throat> or better, make the theory useful, but not good enough to uh, describe what we want to uh, describe. And uh, <clears throat> so that was a problem. There's this uh, ultraviolet divergence. It's infinities in the calculation that come in uh, because of what happened ultraviolet. Ultraviolet means very small scale. And it's a theorem that the uh, amplitudes of quantum gravity do not have these ultraviolet divergences. So the theory is finite. So this is probably the major achievement, finiteness which is also the sort of the reason of claim of interest in uh, string theory. String theory is finite in the ultraviolet. So these two theories uh, um, that have been competing for long, so for the interest of the people when talking about quantum gravity, they both have the same idea that uh, in some sense, there's no physics of the super small. The, the universe is finite when you go down in scale. And the uh, the, the idea that uh, you can go infinitely small and there are always degrees of freedom, it's wrong. Yeah, so there are a lot of good things about theory, but there are also problems uh, in a theory, like every theory has. Uh, for example, the, the derivation of Hamiltonian described uh, the dynamics. So what is your perspective on this? And do you have any ideas how this could be solved? Yeah, I mean, the the the... The, the the attempt to write the dynamics using a Hamiltonian um, was uh, what everybody was trying to do uh, sort of 20 years ago. And uh, the number of, there was a lot of very beautiful uh, progress. Uh, Thomas Thiemann did, uh, did the remarkable things in that direction, for instance, in Germany. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, his collaborators, a um, uh, lot of results, uh, but uh, a lot of difficulties uh, also, and, and Thomas has been focused a lot on these difficulties. This is a, the reason a part of the community branched off and used the uh, um, covariant methods. So trying to define, a Feynman, so trying to define directly the transition amplitudes without using a Hamiltonian. And this has been uh, um, very successful, I, I would say. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that the Hamiltonian uh, formally is, is not going to work. Maybe it is going to work, uh, but I, th I, I think that the, the specific difficulties, uh, um, uh, the fact that there are uh, a number of things which are easy, hard to 
to cho to choose in uh, too many uh, choices to be made. Um, it's all that is not there in the in the in the covariant form. It's a well defined uh, amplitude, a uh, well defined vertex amplitude. So the theory is there is a theory, cleanly defined. Uh, maybe there are others, of course, but there's a theory defined that has uh, uh, the properties that we want, or at least as far as we can see, we have the the amplitude that we work. So I would not consider um, the difficulty the Hamiltonian for formalism by itself a, a defect of the theory. What I would consider a defect of the theory is that um, it's complicated, and uh, uh, there is a. Uh, it's 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 hard to work with. Uh, so because of that, there are completely um, unsolved uh, uh, questions uh, in the application of the formulas. The formulas define order by order um, in some truncation. So uh, uh, there's a number of approximations. We don't know whether uh, this uh, this uh, sequence converges in some sense properly or not. This is completely open yet. So this means that we don't have a theorem that says the theory is coherent and perfect. Not at all. Um, we have a, a hope that uh, the theory, uh, the, the the way we have defined these amplitudes, uh, it's consistent. Namely, when you go to next orders, uh, the, the 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 result doesn't change much. It's only small corrections. So that's a big uh, open question. Um, the other open question is that uh, it would be great to uh, see the Einstein equations to come out, not only in the sort of uh, specific uh, ways in which theorems have shown that they come out, but more richly in 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 uh, in uh, to, to a higher level of approximations that we haven't uh, we haven't yet. So there's a lot of work, and even in the actual application of the theory, I'm trying to apply the theory now to the black to white hole transition. Um, when you sit down and try to apply the theory, you realize that uh, things are complicated uh, and uh, what seemed to be obvious how to normalize things and blah, 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 uh, is not obvious. Uh, so there's a huge amount of work to do, um, technical, but also conceptual, understanding what, what, are we, what we're doing. Because, you know, we're not computing physics in space-time. We're computing physics of space-time. When Einstein wrote general relativity, he was horrendously confused, right? He wrote papers and papers wrong, completely wrong, before writing the right equations. And when he wrote the right equation, then he said all sorts of wrong things. Uh, he said that the you know, universe stopped at the black hole horizon. He said that there's no gravitational waves. He got everything wrong. It took long for clarifying. Uh, theories are hard. And... Uh, especially when they have such big conceptual jumps like generativity, Einstein theory, or like quantum gravity. Um, so uh, there's people who are good to think conceptually should help and think conceptually. People who are good to do calculations do calculation. People who are good in doing rigorous math should do rigorous math. math. And uh, people who know how to do uh, computers should use computers. So I think with... Uh, uh, Solving quantum gravity is a collaborative effort. It's not somebody, it's not a single genius that has it. Like it has one working out generativity. It's just being a big collaborative work. And it's going on. And I'm pretty confident. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty confident that that's, it's, uh, at least that this currently, it's the most uh, convincing, the most uh, uh, likely uh, tool that we have to understand the actual properties of quantum space-time. So another topic that you work on that I find very interesting is time. And you say time does not exist. So could you explain to us what do you mean with time does not exist? In what way does time not exist? Um, uh, not in the sense that uh, the time that is ticking right now, we have for this uh, chat, uh, does not exist. Of course, it exists, right? Uh, it exists. It passes. It goes toward the future. We get old, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but the uh, the way we conceptualize time, all these properties that we naturally associate to time, and the way we understand it, it's limited to the domain of our experience. As soon as we um, enlarge the domain of our experience, because we go to systems that move faster or bigger or smaller. Uh, we have to change something about the way we think about time. And we know that for sure. Okay? Special relativity was exactly that. The realization that when things move fast, 
we have to change our way of thinking time. We cannot anymore think that it's the same present everywhere in the universe. We have to articulate a better understanding of time. And even more, it happened in general relativity and even more it happened in uh, uh, quantum gravity. So uh, the, 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 the sense of this phrase, there's no time, uh, is that the, our usual notion of time is not good anymore. Now, it's a bit more than that. In the fundamental equations of um, loop quantum gravity, there is no time variable. There is the variable T uh, that tracks the passage of time, right? Uh, it's uh, The theory is defined in a different manner. And that's already general relativity. General relativity doesn't have a single time T that tracks the passage of time. Uh, it has a collection of proper times mm, uh, that form a sort of network that uh, affect one another. Um, in quantum gravity, the way to think about the world uh, is that things happen, okay? So it's not that there's no time in the sense everything is frozen. Nothing is frozen. The universe is motion, is happening, is processes. But uh, these processes are not, uh, uh, are not uh, ordered by a single time variable in any decent way. Uh, so it's better to forget the time variable, to describe the process in, independently, each one of which its own, uh, its own variables, and see how they connect one another. And then in some situations, like ours, it's very good to have uh, watches that we all uh, we take all the different processes given by all the watches, they all uh, sort of march at the same beat, and we call this time. Okay, because uh, it's very convenient because we have a common, uh, you know, we have day, night, day, night, day, night. We all, all agree to use that process to order all the rest. The mistake is to think that this way of thinking um, extrapolates to reality in domains far more uh, away from our natural common backyard. Um, in those domains, our usual notion of time does not apply. All right. So uh, thank you very much about uh, talking about all these topics. We're closing to the end. Uh, but before we're going to end this, I would like to ask you two more questions. Uh, so the first question is, uh, why did you decide to study quantum gravity? Why did you study, decide as a student to go into the direction of gravity? Um, it was like falling in love. Um, I was a student uh, in Bologna and uh, there was no quantum gravity in my physics department at all. Uh, I was curious, I had no idea what, what I wanted to do. Uh, I, I, I sort of had this idea that I liked theoretical physics and uh, uh, but I was open to all sorts of things. And uh, then I found a preprint. At the time, preprints were, were, were not on the, on the screen of a of a computer were on the shelf in a in a, uh, in, a in, in the library of the department, um, which was a review of the problem of quantum gravity uh, as it was understood uh, at the time in the late seventies or early eighties. I don't remember. Um, so I read it. I couldn't understand anything, uh, but I thought, well, that's a fantastic problem. There is an open problem at the core of science. Uh, it's a problem, it seems very hard, but doable because we have quantum mechanics, we have general relativity, we have the tools. Just have to be smart enough to put them together. So I decided to study it in depth, to study everything I could about that. And uh, the more I studied it, the more I fell in love. Like when you fall in love with a girl or a boy, the first time you see, wow. And then, you know, if it grows, it grows. Uh, and it grew. And uh, I decided uh, that I, that's what I wanted to do. Um, of course, it was not easy. Nobody around me was doing that. Um, I had to go around and find the few people at the time that were doing that. But I followed uh, what my intuition was saying is the, it's a core, important, uh, major open problem on which there is chance to do, uh, to do progress. I went back in my room, my student room, and I put on the wall piece of paper with written 10 to the minus 33. 10 to the minus 33 centimeters uh, is the scale at which quantum gravity phenomena are expected to be very strong. It's the scale of this quanta of, of, of gravity. 
And so I decided that I want to know what happened down there. And that was, I don't know, 40 years ago. And I've spent, in fact, most of my life trying to do that. I'm very happy. So last question. Uh, do you have any wisdom or encouragement for students who are currently struggling with the studies in quantum gravity or students that want to study quantum gravity? Yes, uh, one. Um, don't rush. In spite of what advisors tell you. I spent my uh, full years of PhD after that, basically uh, studying systematically everything I could find and uh, not publishing any paper. I know that nowadays is, is hard, uh, but uh, uh, it's not by rushing to do a calculation and putting up some papers uh, that you become a good scientist. And uh, is also... You don't become a good scientist by you know jumping on the first idea you hear and uh, and 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 go after it or you know uh, squeezing your head and thinking I have to be creative I have to have, have a new idea or just you know having a new idea and just holding it straight that's not the way science goes ahead the way science goes ahead is not by trying to be creative it's by trying not to be creative and by trying to uh, understand what the problem is. And when you understand the problem is, and you write what you read, you, you you make an effort to understand what the others have done and what has been achieved so far. And then when you have fully understood what where we are, then you say, mm, there's nothing there that just doesn't work very well. Maybe maybe this is wrong. Maybe maybe this can be done. This is this point. I mean, creativity comes from not from picking ideas out of the blue and not from making an effort to be creative. So don't try to be creative. Don't try to be productive. I'm, I'm, try, I'm telling you what everybody else, the opposite of what everybody else tell, <laughs> tells you. I once, um, at a um, many years ago, at a, a conference dinner, sat next to uh, Chandra Sekhar. Chandra Sekhar was uh, at the time the only Nobel Prize in Relativity beside Einstein, was an absolute genius in general relativity, the one who understood uh, uh, the, why stars have that size is the one who figured out the theory of uh, black holes oscillations. So black holes is just, uh, I mean, he was a, and uh, uh, I was sitting next to him and uh, at some point, uh, you know, we were just a little chat, at some point out of the blue, he said, you know, Carlo, to be a good scientist, uh, what you need, as so I was, you know, trying to open my <laughs> eyes, my ear, what, what is he telling me? And what he said is, you know, to be a good scientist, what you need um, is not to be particularly intelligent. I mean, this is a man of spectacular intelligence. What you need is to study a lot. And I think it's right. Okay. All right, so thank you again very much for this interview. It was a real pleasure talking to you, and I hope to hear a lot from you in the future. Thank you very much, Linda. That was very okay. nice. I appreciate it. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. Bye. For everyone who's watching this, also thank you for watching, and have a good day.